Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it to change our lives. We thank you most of all for your sacrifice of your son, Jesus, in our behalf. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive the word, till the soil of our minds and our hearts, that it would sprout and bring forth fruit. Bless Jason as he delivers this word. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Leland. All right, so Colossians chapter 3. And verse 18 is where we're going to start today. Thank you for reading that, Leland. I had about four different people that said, I ain't reading that. So um, <laughs> thank you for doing that. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. Man, I want to just give a shout out to our worship team. Boy, we're just uh, thankful for the way they lead us in worship every week and very thankful for the, Yes, thankful so much for them. And for all the men and women that make it happen and work in the sound and audiovisual and just really blessed by uh, the, the, the time of worship uh, through song. So very thankful for that. So Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18 and 19, uh, we're going to be through the entire text that Leland read over the next several weeks. Uh, we're going to spend the next couple weeks just talking about husbands and wives from these couple verses, verses 18 and 19. And so, uh, you know, pack a lunch, okay, because uh, we're going to jump into it, all right? So we are continuing this study through the book of Colossians, uh, and this is Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. It's about 100 miles from Ephesus. Ephesus is uh, located in modern-day Turkey. Uh, it's important for us to understand and know that little bit. We're going to get back to it here a few minutes later, that Colossae and Ephesus were relatively close, and so and their ministries had connections. So that's going to come up again, so just keep that in the back of your mind here. But remember, the first two chapters of Colossians are theological. <clears throat> this is who Christ is. He is supreme. He is fully God. He outranks all of creation. This is what Christ has done. He went to the cross. He covered your sin. He canceled the debt that was against you by his shed blood. So it's theology. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's done. And if you have been raised with Christ, that's the turn. Start at chapter 3, that's the turn. If you've been raised with Christ, if you believe these things, if they are true, and they are, Paul then gets practical. Then you live like this. So chapter 3, verse 1, if you've been raised with Christ, seek these things that are above. Now the thing about that phrase, calling us to seek these things that are above, to set our minds on things that are above, it is general enough for us all to read it and be like, okay, all right, let's do it. Let's, let's, set those, let's seek those things that are above. Let's set our mind on things that are above, right? Because it's vague enough and we can kind of decide what it means. But as the chapter progresses, Paul gets specific. Paul's like, so if you've been raised with Christ, and this is what you believe, and this is who Jesus is, and this is what he's done for you, and he saved you, then let's start by putting these specific sins to death. Why are you living peacefully, Christian, with these sins in your life if you're different already? If Christ has made you alive, why are you walking around like you're dead? If you have his robes of righteousness, which we do, and theologically we know it, why do you continue to return to your old slave clothes? Why do you do that? And, and while we're at it, let's put on love. Let's put on kindness. Let's put on forgiveness. Let's be ruled by peace. So as like the kind of southern preachers that I grew up with, uh, so now what he's doing is he's, he's preaching. Like Paul's getting to preaching now, and, and our ears are burning because he's getting really specific because the theology about Jesus is important, and it's powerful, and it's freeing. And when you start to make the turn to practical, and it's like set the, your mind on things that are above. Okay, I'm going to do that. But then as he gets more specific, he starts preaching. 
So let's put away wrath and anger and malice. Let's put away immorality. Let's not let those things be named among us, not so that Jesus can save us, but because Jesus has saved us, these things shouldn't be named among us. And he doesn't stop there. He continues to take kind of like the surgeon's scalpel and just kind of dig, and now he's digging right into family dynamics. Uh, Christ's lordship, if you've been raised with Christ, is still in view here. So if you've been raised with Christ, what you do and what you don't do should look differently from the people that have not been raised with Christ. What you kill in your life and what you cultivate in your life should look a certain way because Jesus is Lord over your life. And if you've been raised with Christ, wives submit to your husbands. And if you've been raised with Christ, husbands love your wives. And if you've been raised with Christ, children obey your parents. And if you've been raised with Christ, fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. And bond servants obey your earthly masters. And masters treat your bond servants justly and fairly. So this is why we teach through entire books, okay? Because certainly now, especially in today's time, nobody gets up and is like, let's, let's teach about this. Hey, this is what we'll do today. And also, it helps us understand like, where it's at in the context. The lordship of Christ is still in view. He is lord over everything. He's lord over everything in my life. And he's lord over my family. And he's lord over my interactions with my family. And so now, Paul's gone from preaching to meddling, right? Like, that's what we say, like, now you're meddling a little bit, right? That's what he's doing. And again, these things are not to be done for Christ to save you. It is because Christ has saved you. It is because Jesus is Lord. It is because you've been raised to death, from death to life, this new life is going to look differently for you and your family than the culture around you. And it's going to have different values and different priorities and it's going to treat people differently and read in that better. All of life's interactions, all of them, all of life's relationships for the Christian should be lived with Christ in view. Christ is Lord over all of those things. And that includes family dynamics. And you'll notice that in our text. If you look at verse 18, when he talks about submitting to your own husbands in the Lord. So there's Christ in view. Children obey in the Lord. It pleases the Lord. Verse 22, fearing the Lord. Verse 23, work for the Lord, not for men. Verse 24, you are serving the Lord Christ. So you see how, like, this isn't like a one-off. It's not like Paul's just kind of, I think I'm going to talk about this now in this letter. Like, everything's been building to the practical. Theology to practical. And now he's getting to family dynamics. And I'll just tell you this, one of my personal joys as a pastor is taking passages that are considered controversial, misunderstood, and misapplied, or avoided because they're deemed too troublesome. I love to teach through those passages and watch the truth, like Jesus says, set all of us free. I enjoy that. In Paul's words to the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he emphasized preaching the whole counsel of God. And as a pastor, I'm called to do the same thing, to preach the entire counsel of God. So there's no doubt that this text, taken on its own, is a controversial text today. Almost entirely because of Paul's command for wives to submit to their own husbands. But let me add that this has only become controversial recently in church history and in culture. Now look, we hold here to the belief that the Bible that we read is the inspired and errant word of God. We believe that God gave us his word, not to oppress us, but he gave it to us to save us. And he gave us his word and how to live because he's our designer. And by following his word, we follow his design for our lives, for our families, for creation. And we know that he has given us this as our designer to flourish. That's why he's given us his word. And we are committed at this church by the grace of God to submitting ourselves to the authority of the word of God. And that's all of us. That's not just like kids or or wives or women or whatever. Like all of us, okay? We're not ashamed of what the Bible teaches. And at the outset, let me say that certainly this is considered a difficult text, but some texts are difficult to understand. This really isn't difficult to understand. Like, you have to pretend it's difficult to understand. Um, That's not really where the difficulty lies here. It's difficult because of cultural backlash. It's difficult because of abuse of this text, uh, especially in cults, but also some churches that look good and normal on the outside that abuse a text like this. Uh, It's also difficult because sometimes, if we're honest, we don't like God as an authority. We like God as an authority as long as God agrees with me. And as long as God hates the things I hate and hates the people I hate, and as long as he only calls me to do things that I just so happen want to do, then I like that kind of God. 
Now, of course, when that's the case, God's not the ultimate authority. I am, okay? Um, it's a difficult text as well because there's a great push to redefine marriage and to establish it in its dynamics as we see fit. But marriage is God's idea. He designed it. He had designed it to work in a specific way, and he owns the copyright on it. And if we try to replace his design, it will ultimately crumble. And that is in part why marriage is in the state that it is today. It's difficult because of all the baggage that we tie into that word submission here. So this is a difficult text, not to understand, but it's difficult because of all the things that I mentioned. And it was a difficult text in Paul's day too, but not difficult for the same reasons. In fact, for the opposite reasons. First century culture would have read this first verse, wives submit yourselves to your husband, and they would have been like, obviously, like, duh, like, of course, like, ho-hum. All three groupings later, uh, speaking to husbands, to love, speaking to children, and speaking to bond servants, wives, slaves, and children were already in a submission role in ancient culture. Not Bible culture, ancient culture. Not just a submissive role, they were considered inferior. They had no legal standing or no legal recourse in Greco-Roman culture. When people talk about the Greeks and the Romans as if it was this great time of freedom, they really are completely ignorant of history. It is a great time of freedom for the men, but not for the wives, not for the children, and not for the slaves. Okay? Uh, just one quick example, but Plutarch, a Greek historian and essayist, his advice to new brides was to be hidden away when not with their husbands. Like their only use and value was tied to their husbands. This was a world also in which women had no inheritance. And again, I'm not talking about the world that God prescribes in Scripture. I'm talking about Greco-Roman world. Women, wives had no inheritance. So in places like 1 Peter, where husbands are called to honor their wives and to treat their wife like an heiress, the Bible taught... The Bible treated women radically different from the culture, from the Greco-Roman culture. Husbands were, who were harsh and who treated women like property, uh, the pagans may do that, Peter says. But you're, you're a Christian, and you've been raised with Christ. So husband, you love your wife. You die for her. You live for her. Okay? You treat her like an heiress because she is. You treat her like an heir to the kingdom of God that she is. So submit... Right? For wives, and that verse is not controversial for first century Christian readers or for anyone in ancient culture. What was controversial was that slaves and wives and children were addressed publicly as equals. You can imagine a church assembly and this being read and people that were invisible in the ancient culture that had no standing, no protection. This letter's being read in church and they're called out. Their people are called out. They have standing. God sees them. They have equal value. Christ came to save them too. Christ loves them just as much. They mattered. They existed. And the Bible addresses them directly and treats them like equals and treats them like image bearers of God, which they are. In addition, his words in our text and in some other places to husbands and parents and masters, they were controversial. Why were they controversial? Because Paul calls on them to sacrifice, to lay down your life like Christ did for your wife, for your children, for your slaves even. This would have run against everything a husband would have been taught growing up, let alone a parent or a master. So this text has always been radical, but it's radical for different reasons. And it's interesting, as the time changes and the culture changes, the Bible doesn't, yet it's still controversial today. Women's children, women, children, and slave. Paul here redefines authority. He redefines what it means to lead. Lead like Christ, die to self, live for others, lead by serving. So look, this is going to be like one long sermon these next couple weeks. I don't even know how many weeks we're going to be in it. And so I'm not going to treat it like individual sermons. I'm going to treat it like one long sermon, and we're going to get to where I start getting hungry, okay? And we're going to stop, okay? That's usually about like 1130. So you're good. you got 20, 25 minutes, okay? Um, we're going to, it's going to be one long sermon. We're going to split it over the next couple weeks. And so I, you need to be here for all of it. You need to listen all the way through. And I would love any questions you have or any thoughts or concerns you have. I'd love you to send me a text, shoot me an email. Maybe I'm going to cover it. Maybe I won't. And maybe I will because you bring it up. And so, so help me with that, okay? Um, but I, what I'm going to do is start pulling observations from the text. And when we run out of time, we're going to pick it up next week, okay? So here's the first thing. 
right away off the bat, yes, the text still applies. Okay? So wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's so quick, you could just skip over it. There's really one little sentence. But a common in a common treatment for this text is that it doesn't, no longer really applies. That was a different time, and Paul's speech, speaking out of his cultural context, and times have changed. And I want to point out the fallacy of that argument. Okay, Because if you're going to go that route and say, this no longer applies, we need to stop for a second and realize that Paul doesn't write this in a vacuum. There is a lot that he's saying prior, and there's a lot that he's saying after, and all of it's part of the same argument, like I talked about earlier. Like, if you've been raised with Christ, you're going to put this sin to death, you're going to put on this love and kindness, and your family dynamic is going to change. And so if you're going to say, well, this part about wives submitting to their own husbands, um, let's think about the context. And what grounds could you argue that that one phrase doesn't apply? Do we believe that husbands should love their wives? Because that's what comes next. Well, yes, okay? Uh, do we believe that that still applies? Do we believe that children should obey their parents? Well, well, yes, of course. Do we believe that the verses prior that are part of the same thought and the same argument, that we should put away slander and malice and anger and idolatry and immorality, do we believe that those things still apply? One of the arguments used to dismiss this culturally difficult text is that Paul was only speaking to first century Christians in this instance, and it doesn't apply to the broader culture. But you can see how that argument falls flat on its face because what else in that passage doesn't apply? It's like an example of we apply the things that are easy for us or that don't really cause too much trouble and the other things we explain away. It's possible to arrive at that assumption that the text does not apply if you don't read the context. But Paul is is, this is part of a larger argument. You're different in Christ. Your lives should be different. Put away lying. Put away immorality. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives. The spirit-filled Christ follower is called to all of this, not so that we will be saved, but because we have been saved. And you cannot simply pick and choose which commands here by Scripture to follow based on which commands are easy or which commands are popular or culturally acceptable. In fact, this isn't a one-off verse. The book of Ephesians is a sister letter. I talked about that a minute ago, how they're, they're 100 miles apart, Ephesus and Colossae. Epaphras is saved under Paul's ministry in Ephesus. He returns to Colossae, and a church is started, a work is started. And so both towns in, in cities, churches, receive letters from Paul. The book or letter of Ephesians to the church at Ephesus, and the book or letter of Colossians to the church at Colossae. Those letters were to be passed around to all the churches. The Colossians would have likely already read the Ephesians letter. Okay, That's why Paul, when he talks about this, kind of what we know as household codes, he doesn't even go into the depth that he does in Ephesians. They've probably already read it and familiar with it. So just to pull from Ephesians chapter 5 quickly, we'll throw it on the screen for you. Here's Paul talking about this more at length. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 24, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 33, let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so I want us to, I'm saying all that to say it's not a one-off verse and you can just be like, ah, eh, not really mentioned a lot in Scripture. We have no idea what he's talking about. No, like Paul's talking a lot about this when he gets to family dynamics. And if that weren't convincing enough that the Bible teaches this, that it's to still govern marriage now, there are at least four other books in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter, 1 Timothy, and Titus. All deal with family dynamics and all teach the same thing. So the quick answer initially when we're looking at this and we have to sit with it is, yes, the text still applies. Okay, so we got that. So what's that going to look like? Okay, well, I'm still figuring that out. We're going to get to that next week, okay? Um, no, so here's the second thing. Second, op second observation from the text. Okay, and we'll spend the rest of the time here, and we'll, and we'll get to more of what this looks like and what it doesn't look like next week. But the command here by Paul, all right, first to wives, then he commands husbands and children and so on, but this command is grounded in creation order, not in superiority, not in inferiority. This command by Paul here and in other places, is grounded in creation order, not superiority. In our text, Paul makes this simple statement, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. In the companion text of Ephesians chapter 5, he goes into more detail, and he references this design all the way back to creation. 
He quotes Genesis chapter 2. If you want to do your own reading this week, read Ephesians chapter 5 to help shed some light in as a sister text. Okay? In other words, this isn't something that he's made up on the spot. It's not something that he's recently come up with because of Greco-Roman culture or pressure from the Romans. When Paul is talking about this idea and this dynamic, again, in 1 Timothy, look at his reasoning. Here's 1 Timothy, another great text for you to read on your own. As, that, as Paul gives now justification for why he's doing what he's doing and why he's commanding what he's commanding, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. And this order in marriage where the husband is to lead the home, the husband is not superior and the wife inferior. We're going to talk about that in a second here. But this order in marriage where the husband is called to leave is the order of nature, Paul says. It's not fallen nature, by the way. Not like because of sin, like this is how it's got to be. Like, but nature is God intended. God created both male and female. God formed Adam first. But God said when he saw Adam that it was not good that man should be alone. In fact, in the creation account, and we're doing a, a men's study in Genesis right now. We're going to preach through Genesis after Colossians. Okay? In the creation account, as God creates daily and, and you know, separates the night and the day and the sun and the stars and the, the land animals and the sea animals, every time he finishes... God saw that it was good. But the first time it's not good, the first time it's not finished is when he sees that Adam is alone. And it's not good that man is alone. In fact, in the creation account, he's, that's what he does here. And in Genesis 2, it's just Adam, only male, no female. And for the first time, God says, this is not good. and It's not finished. Creation isn't and wasn't finished. So what we're told is God makes Adam a compliment. Now, not a compliment like, hey, your brisket's fire, bro. Or uh, not a compliment like, I just love your jeans. Are those from Anthro? Like, where'd you get those? Okay, not, like not that kind of compliment. Okay, a compliment, like compliment. Okay, uh, creation was incomplete without woman. That's how serious it is. That God gets done creating Adam and creation is not complete. So God made female to complement male in creation. God has designed that within creation, male and female find not just companionship, but there is a wholeness, there is an integration at a creation level for male and female that cannot be found in only one gender. And that's important because as a side note, uh, that also affirms marriage between one man and one woman. God did not design a wife to be replaced by a gay lover. Okay, God did not design a husband to be replaced by a lesbian lover. Okay, male and female at a creation level. Not just marriage. Marriage is in view, but at a creation level. He designed... I just swallowed a fly. Excuse me here. <coughs> he designed the sexes to complement each other in marriage and in creation. I'm not just talking about marriage, and God isn't either. It doesn't mean somehow that you're not whole if you're not married. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He walked the planet for 33 years. He never married anyone. Fully human, fully male. You are not somehow incomplete if you are a single. You are fully as you are, made in the image of God. You do not need a male or a female to complete you in that sense. This is not marriage in that way. It's like your value is only fully realized if you're married. This is about creation. At a creation level, creation was not complete until he created the woman. She's not created from Adam as an afterthought, like, ah, oh, we got to figure out, they got to have kids somehow. Like, she's created at that point from his rib to make a statement that they are equal, that, that they are both needed, that creation needs them and their giftings equally. Man and woman are fully equal. And so when he's talking here in this command to submit, it is not a command that's grounded in superiority of the male over the female or the husband over the wife. It is grounded in creation order. At a creation level, creation was not completed until God created the woman. Man and woman fully equal. And Adam and Eve and all of mankind, we're told, all of mankind bear the image of God. Adam does not bear the image of God more than Eve. And like that's why he's called to lead us home because he looks more like God than Eve does. They equally bear the image of God. And they have dominion. Both of them, male and female, have dominion over the entire earth. 
This sets humanity apart from the rest of creation. We don't equally share this planet with creation. We have dominion over it. We should care for it. We should be good stewards. We shouldn't waste it. We shouldn't be cruel. All of those things. But we are not like equally sharing this planet. Mankind, men and women, have dominion over creation. The animals are not our equals. They have been put under our authority. They are told in Genesis to care for, to enjoy, even to eat. I am going to take some dominion over some animals later today at lunch. Okay, it's the second time I talked about lunch. I, I see the clock winding down. <laughs> Mankind is a unique creature above all other creatures. That is men and women. Okay? Men and women alone were made in the image of God. Pigs aren't made in the image of God. Fido isn't made in the image of God. And so there is something fundamentally different about human beings fundamentally different from the beginning that we are image bearers. There's something ascribed to us that is not in all of the rest of creation. So what the Bible teaches, I'm just trying to drive this home, the Bible teaches that men and women are equal in creation. And the Bible teaches that men and women are equal in salvation. Like there's hierarchies between the sexes in salvation. Galatians chapter 3, we're going to come to it later. Uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. If you're all one in Christ Jesus, and he's not saying that like sex distinctions don't matter. Paul's point in Genesis 3 is that there's not a hierarchy in redemption either between the people of God, think like Jew and Gentile, believers and unbelievers. You're made in the image of God, right? Like uh, that's who you are, slaves or free people. There's no male or female, like some type of hierarchy for those that are in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So the Bible teaches from the beginning that men and women are equal in creation and that men and women are equal in salvation. That equality that began in creation doesn't change when Jesus comes on the scene. In fact, God creates men and women equal and immediately sin corrupts everything. And once sin enters the world, you have oppression, you have slavery, you have abuse, you have polygamy. All of this inequality. And Jesus corrects it so that in Christ, every single believer, every male, female, every Jew, Greek, every slave, master, every single one are all equal in Jesus. All have equal access to salvation in Jesus Christ. All have equal access to the inheritance that is incorruptible in Jesus. So the Bible teaches equality in creation, equality in Christ. The Bible in no way teaches that women are inferior to men. And at the same time, Paul is not doing away with gender distinctions. What Paul is telling us is that the creation order, Adam created first, then Eve, wasn't a coincidence. It was part of God's sovereign plan. And this call for the husband to lead his home and the wife to follow under that leadership was not an afterthought. You're like, oh, we better figure something out now. Like, there wasn't an afterthought. It was part of a sovereign plan. And I want you, I'm just laying the groundwork here for the next couple weeks, so you've got to stay with me. But turn to Genesis chapter 3. Turn to Genesis 3, look at verse 6. And I know this is, like, thick, but we need this. Because we're going to start getting to what this looks like and what it doesn't look like and why it looks like this and why it doesn't the next couple weeks. This is important. Look at Genesis 3. I love Genesis 3. I love this text. There's a lot of humor here and a lot of, like, like Michael Scott cringe moments, like, like, ah, oh, what are we doing here? So look at verse 6, okay? There's a lot of things you, you learn in Genesis when you go back and you read it again and not just go back to your memories of it as a child. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so here the serpent has come to her and been like, you're not going to die, like did God really say? And she's talking with the serpent and he's deceiving her. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. Then you learn of something else. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Like the entire time, Adam was there and he ate. Adam was with her the entire time. In 1 Timothy, we're told that in this instance, he was never deceived. She was. He wasn't deceived, but he's like, eh, you know, YOLO, right? Like, what, can, what goes wrong here? And he just ate it anyways. And instead of leading and protecting his wife, he's passive. One of the, one of the struggles in marriage, one of the failures of husbands in marriage, you know, we always think about the overbearing and the, the uh, you know, that, that type of husband, and that's absolutely a problem. But one of the great failures in marriage that happens all the time is this passivity. Like, whatever. 
like something that we're guilty of as husbands many times. It doesn't matter what's the point. I don't even care. And we abdicate our calling to lead and to protect. Because here's a scenario. It's not like the husband's always right and he always knows and the wife doesn't. But here's a scenario where Eve was deceived and he wasn't. And Adam has a chance as his calling as a husband to lead and he doesn't. He doesn't. To protect when he knows better. Look at verse 7. So they eat. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? This is, the, this is an important text. When Paul talks about the, the leadership is grounded in creation order, who is the instigator? Like whose idea was it to take the fruit and eat it? It was Eve's. Who, who starts it? If we're like, well, he started it, she started it. She does. When God comes to them, who does he call to give an account? Adam. Not because Eve doesn't have an agency or Eve's inferior. She's going to get her own consequences here in a minute. But God comes to Adam first because God created Adam to lead us home. And he doesn't. Whose idea was this? Eve. And and then, you know, God God like talks to them like, like, hey, whose idea was this anyways? Like, where did this happen? And and you can imagine that scenario, right? They're both hiding behind bushes. And Adam, where did you hear this? Whose idea was it? And he's over there and she's like, no, mm -mm, no, no. I was like, it was really, it was her. And if we're, if we're being honest, like he, Adam, you read the text there, it's the wife you gave me. Like he, the two people he knows, there are only two people. He like offends them both immediately. Like, man, that's a total mess up right there, right? Like her, and if we're being honest, who created her? It was you. That's, that's Adam's response, right? How many nights on the couch did Adam spend after that? Did Eve sin? Absolutely. Does she receive the consequences for that sin? Absolutely. But Adam is the one that God calls out. Adam was created first. Adam is the one who must answer for his family. Adam is the one who must answer for creation because Adam, not like the rest of men, but Adam himself was our representative in the garden. Not because Adam is superior, not because he is more intelligent, because quite frankly, if he's intelligent, he would have just offended the two people on the entire planet. Okay? Uh, not because, but because of the created order that God had established. And so it is to be in the home. Husband, leading your wife and leading your family is not rooted in superiority or inferiority. It is in the created order. God is glorified when we embrace his design for marriage. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what he means when he says wives submit and husbands love. And what he doesn't mean. We're going to talk about limitations to this command by God. We're going to talk about how it's been abused and mistaught. Talk about God's calling on husbands and parents. But what I want to do to finish today is drive home the point that that God's call on the wife to submit to the husband's leading is not based on her inferiority in any way, right, or his superiority. God does not call the husband to lead in marriage because his wife is inferior. The Bible radically opposes that chauvinistic assumption. And any cult or any church that that teaches otherwise or intimates otherwise, they are teaching falsely. And they are leading people away from the one true God. The ancient culture did not value women, but Jesus did. Ancient culture did not value women, but Christianity did. And the Bible most certainly does. And I'll point you back to that verse we were talking about earlier, Galatians chapter 3, and what it meant that there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free or male and female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. This is not a, like, God doesn't see color verse. Like, God sees color. He created us with great diversity. He sees the difference in the sexes. God loves diversity. But what this verse does do is it cuts straight to the heart of equality. In a culture where slaves and women were oppressed and were devalued and have no rights, Paul writes, in Christ, you are all equal. Equal inheritance with the Father. Submission here in Colossians chapter 3 is not about superiority or inferiority. I mean, just even from our own, we know this like all too well in the Stover household. 
Like, I, I married so far out of my league. Ginger and I have been at the grocery store, and the cashier has put down the divider between our things. Like, you're not really with her, bro. Like, good try, okay? Uh, I have to say, like, I'm with her. Uh, we saw this w- between Aubrey and the boys start when they were very little. Like, from very little age, the boys, you know, I do that whole, I got your nose, and they'll be like, give it back, Daddy, give it back. And my Marine, Brady, I can still do them today, and he's still like, give my nose back, Dad, okay? But my daughter, at like a year, the first time I tried it, I was like, I got your nose, and she's like, uh, it's right here. Like, it's, like right away, it's like, okay, I'm dealing with a different level here, right? Um, and then the boys know this right away with their sister, because like, all, they're two years older than her. We have twins, they're two years older than Aubrey, and all through school, like, first grade, Aubrey gets straight A's, and they'll be like, well, wait till you get to our grade, third grade. It's a lot harder in third grade, okay? And then, you know, fifth grade, and, and then you get to high school, and, well, wait till you take AEP classes. It's a lot harder with AEP classes. And, and finally, they just realize, and they stop saying it. Uh, like, Aubrey was just accepted into college with the highest academic scholarship they offer. And her, yeah, it's good, right? Yeah. And her brother Caleb goes to the same college, and they offered him the, hey, you tried academic scholarship. (laughs) He gets a dollar off his next Frosty. That's what he gets, okay? Like, my wife is the creator in our house, and she's the talented one. She operates a miter saw like a boss. I operate the DVR like a boss, but it does not release me from leading and protecting and loving my wife and my children. Often leading looks like helping my wife and my children maximize their gifts. It looks like, how can I make them flourish? And how can I help, help die to self to make them flourish? And more on that in the next couple weeks. But in creation and in redemption, men and women are equal. Submission does not mean inferiority. God has rooted the order that he has designed in the home in creation. And God has gifted women uniquely. And any teaching that demands a silencing or a stifling of those gifts that forbids where the Bible does not is not a teaching in line with Scripture, no matter how many books that person sells. You don't need to follow also when he's leading you into sin. Notice in our text, it's the same for children. Submit to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. Your calling to your husband does not include disobeying God or disobeying in, in almost all situations government. I'll talk more about that next week. But God is our designer. God is our creator. He has a way for the home to function that is an optimal way. And husbands and wives complementing each other like God designed. Broader creation, men and women complementing each other. This church will never be all that it intends to be if all the sisters in the church aren't using their gifting as God has designed. They aren't obeying their God-given calling and flourishing. God created us male and female, and he's called us to use our gifts. Our church and our community needs us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're done today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, Lord, the hope and the comfort that Jesus saves. And we thank you, Lord, that he saves in spite of our sin, and he cancels our sin debt. And it's because he saved us that he calls us to a different life. We confess, Lord, the way we fall short of the life that you've called us to. We rest in your forgiveness for those sins, knowing they are forgiven, and we pray for grace to move forward in obedience, to give us grace as we deal with others and as we interact in the home. We pray for that grace, Lord. The instruments are going to play, and here's your time to speak with God. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian, and you realize you need your sins canceled and covered by the blood of Jesus. So your prayer is, Father, save me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And maybe here, Christian God is showing you an area where you're, you're straying from his calling on your life and calling for you and your family. So here's the time for you to confess that, to receive that forgiveness, and to move forward in grace and mercy. As the instruments play, here's your time to speak with God.